Now they're in danger of not winning the NFC East. Larry is in for Greg tonight with a preview of tonight's instant replay. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. And by the way, the Cowboys still have a shot at winning the number one seed overall in the NFC. So that's pretty crazy when you think about it. So if the Eagles lose at home next week to the Giants, and if the Cowboys can win at Washington, then the boys will claim the NFC East because of a better division record coming up tonight on instant replay. This is not as easy as, you know, everyone or I may look or other guys may may look or make it seem, you know, I promise you sacking the quarterback's not that easy. Cowboy star linebacker Micah Parsons has just one sack in his last five games. He still leads the boys with 13 sacks this season. Dorrance Armstrong is next with eight. Micah still has that lion mentality, though, as the leader of the boys linebacking core. I think it's just fun. It excites me and it's entertaining for me to, you know, go against the best players. Luka Doncic dropped 51 points on the Spurs last night. Jeremy Sohan certainly tried his best to slow Luka down. Now it's time for the Spurs to turn the page and tip off the new year in Brooklyn. Tonight we will reveal our top 12 local sports stories for 2022 and UTSA football definitely made the cut after winning its second straight conference USA championship plus the CFP national championship game is all set and a fifth grade basketball player gets Aaron Sierra Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram play of the week that and much more including NFL highlights tonight on instant replay. If you ask me the national championship game was the last game last night. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good one. Didn't end the way I wanted. Nope, Thanks, sure did it. <laughs> the second earthquake in an area of Northern California in a matter of weeks will show you the moment yesterday's quake hit. Plus, a rare look inside the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office. They identify people and investigate causes of death. And tonight, we find out what staff members call the hardest part of the job. It is rare that cameras get a look inside the Bear County Medical Examiner's office, but for this case that explains, our team did. Death is a part of the job there, but sometimes answering how a person died is the easy part. Yeah, finding out who that person is can be much harder. Myra Arthur talks one-on-one -on -one with the Chief Medical Examiner and Chief Investigator to offer some insight into the mystery surrounding what it is they do, reconnecting unidentified remains to the names and the lives they left behind. You're the last physician that a patient's going to see. Dr. Kimberly Molina deals with death, but that's not how she would describe this job. I would say we actually do what we do for the living, which I think a lot of people don't understand. The living, those left behind and left with questions. But there are often questions about what happens here. What does it mean when someone dies and ends up in the care of the medical examiner's office? The most common preconception that people have is that if someone comes to our office, if the death falls under our jurisdiction, they think immediately, oh, they think someone killed them, that it's a homicide, that, that all we do here are homicides. And we do do homicides here. That is our jurisdiction. But our jurisdiction is actually any unnatural death. So car accidents, people who fall down and maybe hit their heads, or cases where we just don't know. They may not be under a doctor's care, may not have significant medical history. Nicole Healy is chief investigator for the medical examiner's office. Investigation section where the eyes and ears of the doctors, of the actual forensic pathologist at the scenes. She and her team respond to the scene of a death. Law enforcement may investigate if someone died as the result of a crime. She wants to know why they died. It's number one, why did the person die, but then also who are they? Unfortunately, it does happen where cases take, you know, weeks, months, even years for us to really figure out what happened. Have they ever been fingerprinted? Well, run fingerprints or like, do you know who their dentist is? Yes, they were seen here. We can take x-rays and see if they have sort of any implanted hardware, for instance, a pacemaker, or maybe they've had a hip replacement. And, and try to track people down that way. We can actually contact the manufacturer of these devices and ask them to assist us as to what hospital did you send this to? What date was it manufactured? What date was it implanted? People sometimes will have tattoos um, that will say who they are, at least give us family members. What happens if you hit a dead end, if none of those options work? Currently working probably 20 active cases within the past 10 years. 20 people whose names the medical examiner's office does not know, but is still working to find out. So they turn to the internet. On May 29th, 2021, 
the body of an unidentified man was discovered in the 8,900 block of Mission Road in San Antonio. This spring, the medical examiner's office redesigned its website highlighting those unidentified cases, sharing what is known about the person. He was five foot eight inches tall and weighed about 140 pounds. He had a tattoo on his upper left arm showing a flag, heart, and a ribbon. This is another tool in our toolbox that we didn't have 20 years ago, right? 10 years ago. Now we have it, let's use it. Each case includes a forensic sketch of what it's believed that person looked like. These forensic artists are not necessarily looking at a face when they are drawing these sketches. They have to put together details that may not be there. Absolutely. Um, it's going to be case by case. Sometimes they can do a sketch. Sometimes they go into even more, um, more forensic artwork where they're just getting details, information, molds, and going from there. It's those unidentified cases that so often stick with this team. Even if you have the cause and manner of death, even if you could provide closure to family, you don't even have the family to provide the closure to. An extraordinary effort to identify remains came in June when 53 migrants died after being trapped in the back of a sweltering 18-wheeler. The medical examiner's office worked with consulates from Mexico, Honduras, and Guatemala to identify those who passed. And just a month before that, the horrific shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office again was tasked with responding in the aftermath of that tragedy. Doctors from other parts of the state were called in to help. When people come into our care, there's not a choice, right? The families don't actually have a choice. There's some part of the mandate, the legal mandate, that has brought them into our care. We absolutely want to make sure that families understand that we are going to treat their loved ones with dignity, with respect. We're going to get the answers that they deserve. Even if in some cases, it takes years. This is someone's loved one, their son, their mother, their daughter. They have a name now. This is our day at the office. This is what we do. But each call, it's that family's worst day of their life. I don't think we see the death all day. We see the living. All right, take another look outside with live cam here tonight. It's a little muggy. Last week, of course, it was colder than average to start off the week, and then we saw a warming trend take place, and really, that was with us as we wrapped up 2022 and now heading into 2023. Highs today, much warmer than the average. Our average high for January 1st is 63 degrees. We were in the upper 70s and even some 80s. 78 here in town. Del Rio reached 87 earlier this afternoon. Temperatures cooling down. We're in the 60s. A couple low 70s though were some of that fog and cloud cover developing. Kennedy, Pleasanton stretching over to Victoria. Still upper 60s here in San Antonio. Again, that moisture is with us overnight and first thing tomorrow morning. So patchy fog as well as some drizzle is expected. And then we see the first of a couple fronts move in and the much more comfortable air takes us throughout the second half of the week. More details on that in just a few. We'll look forward to it. Thank you, Mia. A power outage and fire are two things you really don't want to happen when you're on a Ferris wheel. Well, both happened in Florida last night. Find out how long dozens of people were left stranded. And cities trying to climb out of a housing crisis getting bogged down by a trend industry leaders call out of control. Why local experts say short term rentals are part of the problem. It's a U.S. housing crisis hitting San Antonio too these days. In fact, in its latest budget, the city approved $136 million for affordable housing to address the shortage. But there's another factor too. The night team's Patty Santos with what an eviction attorney says is happening with short-term rentals that's causing more harm to those looking for a long-term home. One of the root causes for eviction is a lack of affordable housing. Professor Gregory Slotnick works on eviction prevention through the St. Mary's University School of Law. We've seen rental home uh, rates go up double digits, 10 to 20 percent. His clients are having a hard time finding a home they can afford. There are several factors, including the growing use of short term rentals. And that cuts in. Um, there's a finite number of housing units here in our city. Um, the more units that are available through the short term rental platforms, the fewer rentals are available for long-term leases. 
More than 4,600 homes have a short-term rental permit, but the City of San Antonio Development Services Department estimates about 3,300 of them are active. The number of permits increased 169% since the city adopted its STR ordinance in 2009. Roughly 1,700 plus permits were handed out that year. Districts 1 and 2 have the largest number of permits. One hesitates to think about what that could look like four more years down the road. Slotnik knows STRs is an attractive way for property owners to make extra income, but he fears it could impact the character of neighborhoods and limit families trying to establish roots in them. It really creates an unfortunate divide within our community. He says it's really up to state lawmakers to give cities the flexibility to experiment with other ways to regulate STRs. This isn't just limited to one neighborhood or one district, but you know, affordable rents, that's in all four precincts across our county um, and in all 10 districts in our city. He says one of the problems is that there has not been a study done on how STRs affect affordable housing. The city of San Antonio does collect a hotel occupancy tax uh, from STRs and those who have permits. That hotel occupancy rate is used to support programs like tourism and cultural programs here in the city. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Heading your way, a Northern California community rocked by yet another big earthquake. How big this one was, coming your way after the break. A rather scary and exciting way to start the new year and your day. Uh, earthquake in Northern California this morning. Check out the surveillance video from the Rio Del Police Department. You can see the moment the 5.4 magnitude quake hits. The U.S. Geological Survey says some damage is possible so far no deaths have been reported. It is the second earthquake in that area in just a matter of weeks. A 6.4 magnitude quake was recorded back on December 20th. Oh, dude, it's on fire. Yikes. Yeah, yikes is right. New video shows the moments before 62 people were rescued from a Florida Ferris wheel. This was the scene last night at the wheel at Icon Park in Orlando. The entertainment complex says the wheel lost power, but details on what caused the power outage have not been released. The outage causing a small fire to spark briefly at the bottom of the ride. It took rescue climbers more than an hour to safely evacuate guests from the 20 of the uh, from the 20 wheels observation pods. The 400 foot wheel is one of the tallest in the U.S. And that is why I don't go on Ferris yeah, wheels. That is incredibly stuff. terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And nothing scary about our weather, though. No, no, it's very nice. You know, I've been jokingly complaining that it's hot, but yeah. I think in comparison to what the rest of the country has been dealing with, it's very been lovely. True. And I think probably after the stretch of days that we had below freezing last week, probably good to give the pipes a break, the plants a break and things like that. Even though, yes, temperatures have been well above the average over the past couple of days. Last night, as you were stepping out for fireworks plans, didn't feel too bad out there. We had drier air in place. In fact, dew points were about 20 degrees lower where they are right now. It actually was a little chilly out there in spots last night. Stepping out tonight, you definitely can feel more of that moisture in place. You're going to look at those dew points, how we measure the moisture, the low levels of the atmosphere here this Sunday night in the 60s. So you can feel more of that mugginess. And because of that Gulf moisture that continues to pump in to South Central Texas, already seeing some fog develop up and especially across the coastal plains visibilities are starting to drop. In fact, here in San Antonio over the past hour or so, we've also started to see some of the cloud cover work back in. That is yet another sign that we just have more of that humidity in place as well. So through the overnight hours and into early Monday morning, we are expecting more pockets of fog to develop, some of which could be dense in spots. So again, good idea to pack your patience if you are stepping out tomorrow morning because some pockets of drizzle will be possible with some of that fog as well. And then as we head into the late morning hours of our Monday, that looks to break up a little bit more and we should see decreasing cloud cover throughout our Monday afternoon. But temperature wise, as of right now, we're in the 60s for a good portion of the area because of that cloud cover moving in. Again, we're not likely going to see those temperatures budge a whole lot over the next 
next several hours. In fact, in some spots, they could even warm a degree or two by the time we're waking up tomorrow morning. So we'll say 60s for a good chunk of the area, maybe some upper 50s possible the closer to the Rio Grande that you get in our far western counties. Around 68 by 10 a.m. here in San Antonio tomorrow. And then after we see some of that cloud cover break up into the afternoon, more peaks of sunshine expected to take over, helping those temperatures warm into the mid 70s by the early afternoon. And we've got daytime highs around 80 degrees, so almost 20 degrees warmer than the average high for this time of year. It also could be a little breezy at times tomorrow with some wind gusts out of the southwest, generally upwards of about 20 to even maybe 25 miles per hour at times by late morning and into the afternoon. This is all ahead of our next cool front that moves in tomorrow evening and especially tomorrow night. Off to our west, there's an area of low pressure that's approaching the Four Corners region. You can see some snow filtering across portions of the Rockies, even some rain across the desert southwest associated with that system. What essentially is going to happen over the next 24 hours? That low pressure system is going to track eastward and it's going to help push this front through our area. So we'll look to find it move through San Antonio around midnight tomorrow. It is possible that we find a few showers mainly east of town push through into the early morning hours of our Tuesday along with that boundary. As of right now, the storm activity looks to sit farther off to our east, but still a quick splash of rain mainly east of town, not completely out of the question before the sun comes up Tuesday. We are not expecting severe weather with this system. That threat has shifted well off to our east, closer to the Arklatex region and far east Texas. It is unfortunate though that we can't get a little bit more rain. 2022, second driest year that we have on record. And as we look at that seven day forecast, Really, we're quieting things down, drying things out with more sunshine throughout a good portion of the upcoming week. Maybe a few isolated showers possible early next week. So we'll keep our fingers crossed, guys. My grass is dead. You have grass? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, you know what's shocking? Our neighbor was like, wow, you know, up until now, you guys were doing good. Yeah. Finally died. Thanks for that. Please rain. <laughs> okay, let's change the subject. I'm getting sad. Avatar The Way of Water is staying afloat in the box office. We'll tell you whether the crowds were big enough to keep it from sinking to number two. I think what we have here in Hollywood is high art. The golden age of Hollywood epic Babylon slipped from fourth to fifth place this weekend on ticket sales of $2.7 million, while musical biopic Whitney Houston, I Want to Dance with Somebody, went from third to fourth with $4.3 million. Black Panther Wakanda Forever jumped back into the top five this weekend, up from sixth place to third with $4.8 million, as Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, held on to second place with $16.3 million. James Cameron's Avatar The Way of Water continues its reign at the top of the box office this weekend. The sci-fi sequel netted $63.4 million, bringing its domestic box office total to $440.5 million. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. From Manu's call to the hall to O'Connor softball winning a state championship, 2022 was another great year for local sports. Yes, it was. And the CFP National Championship game is all set after two exciting semifinal games. With more on what's an instant replay, let's head over to Larry Ramirez. And notice that I gave Courtney the CFP read. Thank you. Sorry about your book, guys. <laughs> because he's still a good crying. Good game. <laughs> it was a good game indeed. So TCU and Georgia will play for all the marbles. And tonight we will reveal our top 12 local sports stories for 2022. It was a kind of an old-fashioned Big 12 shootout in some ways, um, but like I said, I mean, we came out with a with a very physical mindset. You know, we were the most physical team on the field tonight, and I think that was easy to see. TCU loves being the underdog. Michigan was favored by seven and a half to beat the Horn Frogs in the CFP semis, but TCU is marching on and will try to knock off the heavily favored Georgia Bulldogs. They outcompeted us throughout the game, just. Uh, struggled to find ways to execute. Um, 
our job, so it made it tough to tough to move the football. I mean, props to them. They're a good team. Houston Texans fell to the Jacksonville Jaguars today, snapping their nine-game winning streak against the Jags. And Houston failed to find the end zone for the second time this season. So that leads us to our poll question tonight. Will Davis Mills be the Texans' starting quarterback next season? You can vote on Twitter at Instant Replay SA or email us your yes or no answer. Plus, Joshua Franco was in the ring on New Year's Eve. That's coming up later on Instant Replay. Just a few moments, actually. Yeah, a lot to talk about in the first IR of the year. Yes. Thanks, Larry. All right, and we'll be right back.